Hi, and welcome to the Desert Lady Diaries podcast, a weekly conversation with women who found their home in the Mojave Desert. I'm Dawn Davis, and this is episode number 42. If you're a first-time listener, welcome. And if you're a returning listener, thank you so much for coming back. If you're looking for more information about the podcast, past guests, or want to catch up on previous episodes, or just want to drop me a line, it's all at the website DesertLadyDiaries.com. We're on Facebook and Instagram at Desert Lady Diaries and on Twitter as Desert Lady Diary. Today's conversation is with writer and author Ivy Pakoda. We talk about the role Wonder Valley played in her most recent book, also titled Wonder Valley, her discovery of the desert, and her work teaching creative writing in Skid Row. I'm here today with Ivy Pakoda. She's the author of the critically acclaimed novels Wonder Valley and Visitation Street. Wonder Valley was a Los Angeles Times Book of the Year and was also an NPR Best Book of 2017. Visitation Street was chosen as an Amazon Best Book of 2013 and a Barnes & Noble Discover Great New Writers selection. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, Los Angeles Review of Books, Huffington Post, Self, and House and Garden. Her first novel, The Art of Disappearing, was published by St. Martin's Press in 2009. She teaches creative writing at the Lamp Art Studio in Skid Row, and she was a world-ranked squash player that grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and currently lives in West Adams, Los Angeles. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Sure. So the first question I usually ask our guests is, what was your first encounter with the desert? Well, I moved to L.A. in 2009, and everyone talks about going out to the desert. I didn't really know what that meant. Mm -hmm. I'd read Play It As It Lays by Joan Didion, and there's this sort of vague idea that they're always going out to the desert to Mm -hmm. film this movie, and it seemed like odd and mysterious, and all this bad stuff was sort of going on out there in the movie, the the movie they're filming, and um, it seemed very wild. So I thought the desert was Palm Springs, and I went to Palm Springs. (laughs) And I didn't really see much desert there. (laughs) Not all that different from other places I'd been. And so I did a little more research and realized a lot of people were going to Joshua Tree and talking about that as the desert. I figured, okay, well, that's perfect. There's a lot of like young people from Brooklyn, where I'm actually from, are going to Joshua Tree. I said, I'm going to go to Joshua Tree. And this is right at the very start of Airbnb. And I booked a house... And it said it was in Joshua Tree, <laughs> and I drove through Joshua Tree, and then I drove through 29 Palms, and we still weren't there. I was starting to get a little nervous. Mm-hmm. And we wound up in Wonder Valley, me and my husband, which is pretty far out, especially if you've never been here before. So it was like, turn left on this sand road, then count three roads, and like, there's this other road, and you try to get there during the day. <laughs> and I'd never been anywhere like that. I mean, mm. here, at least, you recognize sort of, you know, there's stores. Right, <laughs> like, exactly. There's a coffee shop and a supermarket. <laughs> like, Wonder Valley doesn't really have that. No. And I was transfixed by the fact that there was this giant, vast area that was pretty empty, and yet people lived there. And growing up in the East Coast and going to the countryside there, it's there's green and there's yeah. trees. It's a lot more sort of like clustered. So I'd never, it just was a vast vacant place that was unknowable. And I was was pretty infatuated from the beginning. Did you get there during the day? Yeah. You did, fortunately. Okay, Mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people get here late in the evening and it's interesting to hear their reaction the next day when they wake up and see what's actually around them. Yeah. I mean, that kind of happened because we were sort of exhausted and was like, where are we? And we rented this amazing house from an artist named Perry Hoffman and it's all tile, all mosaic, and it's really, oh, yeah. really beautiful. And, you know, I guess we didn't, I didn't know. And I think his house has gotten a little more attention since then. Yeah, and he's on the art tours that happen to, uh, once a year in the fall. Yeah, mm-hmm. someone was coming I've to film it. Oh. Yeah, while we were there. And I was like, wow, is this like a famous place? And mm-hmm. I've read about it a few times since then. Mm-hmm. It's really, really stunning. He's created something magical. Yeah. And what he has is a platform that looks like a dock and a lake, but it's really just for watching the desert. So... Mm-hmm. That was just the first, great I love first. the bathroom. Oh, my God. It's the amazing. bathroom is super cool. I know. I loved everything, <laughs> even the giant desert rat that was running around with a plum in its mouth. Mm. Oh. It was that big. I was like, whoa, it's a pretty big rat. Yeah, we have some creatures out here. Yeah, it's okay. So that was your first time yeah. coming out. And yeah. how many times had you come out before you started researching for your book? Let's see. So then I came back once or twice after that and I stayed somewhere else and then I stayed at the 29 Palms Inn and I was really nice I just came out for like two nights with a friend from New York and I thought I have to start writing a book excuse me I'm getting over a cold the desert air is helping it's making me feel mm-hmm. better <laughs> that's good but um 
what happened? Oh, yeah, I was just out there at the end. I thought, you know, maybe I'd like to, I have to get some, a serious amount of work done for about six weeks. I want to rent a house. So I rented a house. I looked at a bunch of different long-term rentals, mm-hmm. but it turned out the inn has properties kind of near it in 29 mm-hmm. Palms. Yeah. So I rented a house from them for six weeks and I didn't really research the desert. I was just living here. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know if you can say you were living somewhere for six weeks, but I was here for six weeks. So that's how the research happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So during that six weeks, let's talk about maybe some things that you experienced or happened while you were here. It was great. I mean, I loved it. The first night was crazy. I think it was like November 2nd. It was really early on in November. It was like the first or second of November. And I came out in this massive windstorm. And it was kind of creepy. Things were just like knocking into this house and blowing everywhere. And it was... It was wild. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. Like, I'm by myself. And it was on a paved road, like in... Not quite in town, but it was a little nerve-wracking. That was like the most dramatic weather... Then we had some rain. Oh, lucky you. Yeah, we had rain, Because it too. doesn't happen often. I know. It was like the next day. That's right. The next day it rained. I was like, wow, it's really different out here. Then every other day it was like normal. Right. <laughs> like, normal Cal- Southern yeah, California. Was like, there was this massive windstorm. I was like, wow, it's crazy. And then there was like a rainstorm. I was like, oh, wow, I guess I really didn't understand the desert. I was like, oh, no, I got it. It's yeah. cool. <laughs> well, and it's amazing. After one of those windy, you know, either whether it's a full day or a full day and night into the next day, because that does happen, too. Everything appears clearer, I yeah, think. Yeah, totally. After that, the stars, just the sky in general kind of blows stuff out, yeah, you know? It, it yeah. was beautiful. It was pretty dramatic, and I was sort of excited to see the dramatic shifts. Mm-hmm. I was very happy to be here that time of year, which is mm-hmm. ostensibly this time of year, too, but it's quite right. hot today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's unusual for February. Yeah, right. I was just looking at my gas bill, yeah. and I was like, wow, I'm saving money because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not using my heater as yeah. nearly as much as I did it's last like year. It's like 85 degrees out. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, When you were coming up with the concept for mm-hmm. your book, mm-hmm. how did the desert come into that thought? Well, I was, um, I was writing, I had initially come out with a plan to write a book that was set primarily, um, in Los Los Angeles in Skid Row. And as I was sitting here writing, I remembered that a story, I teach creative writing in Skid Row. And one of the women in my workshop had told me a story about growing up on a hawk farm in Arizona, Mm -hmm. not a hawk farm. I'm sorry, a goat farm in Arizona. And her brother shot a hawk and her father was very upset about that. And I was just thinking about that, and I was thinking, well, it's like kind of, I mean, I've been to Arizona, my uncle lives there. Mm -hmm. It's probably pretty similar to what's going on outside this window. Mm -hmm. And then it was her story, and I was writing about Skid Row, and then I started writing a scene set here, just kind of thinking about her and that farm. And Mm -hmm. then I was like toggling back and forth between chapters set in the desert and chapters set in Skid Row. And you know, part of my book is set in a commune. And I don't know if there are any communes out here. I'm sure there could be. It, I think many years ago, yeah. like back in the 70s, of course, right. that was like commune. I would say there probably were. I've only been here myself 18 months full time. Oh, okay. So I'm I'm learning as I interview people that have been here for 40 some years, I'm learning more about the history. But right. And if there were any, they would probably been in Joshua Tree because even then that was known as like the, the right. hippie place. Hippie place. Yeah. So I figured it was like, <laughs> well, there could be now. It's so off the grid and there's so many things that happen out of sight. So I thought, I wanted to write about this commune that I visited a long time ago and I wanted to write about this incident with this hawk and suddenly Mm. I realized oh I really do want to write about the environment I'm staying in that's cool yeah given the fact that you have now incorporated Wonder Valley into your book and it's Mm -hmm. the title of the book yeah have you heard from any people who live here that are I don't know disappointed (laughs) (laughs) I mean or feel like some of it may be misrepresented or anything like that. Has that come up at all for you? A little bit. Somebody did comment that they were worried that I was making a correlation between Skid Row and the desert, which is clearly no, no. not happening. No. So that was a little bit off-putting. I think you can have two things in a book without comparing them. One of the interesting things about writing about Skid Row is that everyone's story starts somewhere else before you you get to Skid Row. So I read at the Palms restaurant last night Mm -hmm. in Wonder Valley, and I was incredibly nervous. I don't get nervous about literally anything. (laughs) But, you know, you don't want to read about a place that you wrote about that you don't live in to a bunch of people who live there. And everyone was very excited to hear it and mm-hmm. had tons of questions. And there are a lot of people there who I wouldn't, ne- who don't necessarily read a lot and bought the book and mm-hmm. really excited to see their place brought to life. And mm-hmm. it's sort of a great honor to yeah. have that experience as a writer. I'm not even from California, so to write a California novel <laughs> is terrifying. <laughs> 
to write a novel about a very small place. You know, people are very proud from a small place. I, my previous novel, Visitation Street, is about a small neighborhood in Brooklyn. It is not the neighborhood I grew up in, but it's one I lived in. And everyone's so proud of it. And like, they're kind of like outsiders and they're a little bit mm. aggressive towards infiltrators. And well, I was nervous about that. And, you and know. sometimes private, you know, sometimes that yeah. comes up. Yeah. But you know, everyone's been really receptive. It was curious. I'm, I might be wrong, but people seem pretty excited. So that, that's yeah, been great. Yeah, no. Well, and I think one has to remember that it's a fiction book. Yeah, so you can take different elements of different things and put together whatever you want. For sure. Right? And like if you, I mean, I tend for the most part to only write about places I know very, very well. And mm -hmm. the book is not really set in Wonder Valley except for those like three chapters. And Wonder Valley represents for these two characters this notion of escape. Mm -hmm. Like they're going to start over there and it's a very evocative name. And Skid Row, if you write about Skid Row, you don't want to call it like Skid Row, a desperate place. I thought Wonder Valley gave it the title for this novel, like a sense of like possibility and joy. Mm -hmm. So when I came out here and I first went to Wonder Valley and I was like, is it ironic? Like, why do they call it this? I mean, is it wonderful? I don't get it. And I started reading a lot about it and it is beautiful. Like at first sight, you might not think that, but then it is. And like the idea that you can find beauty in unusual places mm -hmm. is really evoked by the area of Wonder Valley to me. So that's like an important notion that carries through the whole book mm -hmm. and, you know. When Teresa suggested that I interview you mm -hmm. and I did a little research mm -hmm. and I said, oh, she's at Lamp. Oh. Did you meet Molly? No. Do you know Lamp? I do. Oh, wow. I lived downtown LA for three and a half years. Okay. Before I came out here. And I did a lot of advocacy down in Skid Row. And then in my own neighborhood, I was in South Park by the Staples Center. Sure. So I would go out with uh, one of the guys from one of the yeah. bids and we'd go around and make our visits to our, our regulars, if right. you will, that we had down there. Because it was... There wasn't the homeless population there that there is in Skid Row. Right. So I said, oh, she's worked at Lamp in Skid Row. I work in a very specific corner of Lamp. I mm -hmm. only work in the art studio. Right. And I know the guy, and I was like, what is his name? Hike Magmarin. Yes, that's it. We were Hike. He and I were in an improv class. Really? In another uh, actor friend of mine, she did a workshop down there, and he was part of the improv workshop, and that's how I met him. Oh, wow. Yeah, and then yeah. friends of mine are working on the refresh, not the one that's just come in recently, the okay. more, more mobile showers, but my yeah. friend Michael and Alyssa, we had a fundraiser there at LAMP for... Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You really know what I'm oh, talking yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow, that like, never happens. Yes, so I work with Hike. He's and awesome. he's one of my favorite people in the entire world. Yeah. What he does with that studio is just so amazing. There is never a sense that he's working with homelessness. It's no. just, he's got somehow this idea that art is something that should be made available to anyone, regardless mm -hmm. of you know, financial circumstances. Right. And he's got this amazing worldview where he just doesn't see the differences between people. And he's just a truly remarkable human being. Mm -hmm. And works way too hard and is completely scatterbrained <laughs> and like you know it's just like I don't know what's going on but he's great yeah so I work with him um, whenever I'm in town as much as possible mm -hmm. and I'm going to a period where I'll be around for the next three months so I'll okay. be there all the time we yeah. started a zine together oh neat the Skid Row zine from, oh that's great yeah, that's great. yeah. you're teaching creative writing yeah. there mm -hmm. and how did that come about how did you well I lived in the arts district and I would my squash where I play squash is in downtown on 7th street so mm -hmm. I would commute through Skid Row just up 5th Mm -hmm. up 6th down 7th every day and that's literally the heart of Skid Row like yeah. right, that's it so I would go up and down the streets and I was like what is that I mean you hear Skid Row mm -hmm. and, and then you know if the more you drive through it the more you become used to it it's not scary it's not like it's not depressing what oh, is depressing it, it's not like it's not this horrible place it's a community mm -hmm. you get to, you, you start to see a pattern and you start to see that people aren't just like some people are yes passing out in the street because they're completely mm -hmm. unable to care for themselves but other people are living there and they're organizing their lives and they're setting mm -hmm. up real homes to the best of their ability. And I sort of became interested in what sort of community was down there. And then I knew people were commuting in for the day to Skid Row to spend the day downtown, which mm -hmm. I became incredibly interested in. I remember this is what happened. One day <laughs> I saw a bunch of people getting off a bus and like going to hang out in the street corner. Mm -hmm. I was like, why would you spend the day down here? Like, what is it about Skid Row? And so I watched a documentary called Lost Angels, something or other, mm -hmm. the story of Skid Row. And it was actually mostly about LAMP. And at the end, there was like a get involved email. And it was like late at night. I had a few glasses of wine. I'm like, oh, I'm totally going to do that. And I emailed them. And the next day I got an email back. And they're like, will you come teach creative writing? And I went in and I started almost immediately. It was like five years ago. It's great. I love it. Mm -hmm. It can be hard. 
Yeah. It can be frustrating. Writing is a really hard thing to teach. The art is a little easier because you always come back to your painting. You know, you're adding onto your collage or whatever. Mm. Writing is tr- harder. And the writing is in many ways mm. that you don't see the end result as quickly. So we decided to do the zine, the homemade magazine, as something to make it more concrete. So nice. that's good. Yeah. Anybody who can go down there and do work down there, I have a soft spot in my heart. Yeah, for <laughs> I know. Me too. Um, yeah. I realize, it's funny, I realize that there are some days, and it was funny, I was thinking I was talking to, oh, I was talking to one of the women in the workshop, Linda, about this. I was like, you know, well, for the most part, I go in and I'm fine. And yeah, sometimes you see something, you're like, oh man, that is just, that's mm-hmm. just like, yeah. well, my friend who works in refugee camps, when I took him to Skid Row, he's like, this is as bad as the refugee camps yeah. in Lesbos and Greece, you know? It's, really, it's like, this yeah. is bad. I'm like, oh, but what you do is way worse. He's like, no, this is really bad. But, you know, for the most part, you go in, I do my work, I'm used to everything. Mm-hmm. And then every once in a while, there'll be a day where I'm like, whoa, that is a messed up scene over there. Like, that's really bad, what I'm yeah. looking at right now. But then I was talking to my friend Linda, and she's in her 70s, and she was formerly homeless. She's an amazing artist. She has a scholarship to the Art Institute of Chicago and wow. all these other places. But she had some health issues that bankrupted her and so whatever she wound Mm -hmm. up on the street now she's housed and fine and Mm -hmm. she's awesome but I was like you know Linda the other day I just had to park a couple blocks away from Lamp and walked in I was like it is bad down here today and she's like yeah it's like the last couple days have been really bad and sometimes that has to do with time of the month people waiting for their money to come in and they're getting a little desperate right exactly oh well then after the money comes in it's also like a party scene exactly well and then there's that whole other world down there with the gangs and you know you don't just run down there and pitch your tent on the sidewalk if you're in a certain area of the sidewalk that property quote unquote belongs to a certain gang and you're either maybe you're prostituting maybe you're hiding the drugs Maybe you're selling the drugs. Who knows? Yeah. But it's a whole thing. I yeah. took the um, Central Division. Does a it's not called community policing. Oh, but I know something what you're similar. About. Yeah. It's like an eleven week program. Yeah. Oh, you took that? I did. Oh, wow. Yeah, because I was be- I took it before I was starting my just my volunteer work down right. there because I wanted to kind of get an idea of that side. Yeah. You know, kind of see both mm-hmm. come in with a balanced approach, right. if you will. Yeah. So that must have been interesting. Yeah. So there are days it has gotten, I don't know how long you've, you've been gone from LA for three years. No, I'm here 18 months now. Oh, yeah. okay. Right. Yeah. So you were in LA until then. I mean, mm, yeah, it's gotten <laughs> exponentially more crowded downtown and like in Skid Row and that, you know, I, I, I'm always annoyed by this. My friends are like, God, the homeless problem in LA, it's just gotten so bad. You see encampments along the highways. Now I'm like, have you ever been downtown? It's always been really bad. Right. And like, you're just noticing it because it's in your neighborhood. And yes, right. it's worse, Spreading, obviously. Yeah. But like, this has been going on forever. Right. I mean, it goes back to like the twenties. Yeah. When guys were coming in on the train just for work and they needed some place to right stay, downtown, yeah. that's which is where all those uh, single room occupancy yeah. places came mm-hmm. from. That's exactly. what they did, a small bachelor kitchen and all that stuff. So. It doesn't help that the Greyhound Depot was down there, no. too. You get all, they should move that. But I, I'm always like, you're, you're making the problem <laughs> right. worse. Right, and you're, or you're making it too easy for yeah. other states or whoever exactly. to say, Bust here's in. your ticket to yeah. L.A., yeah. good luck. Yeah, You're in the right place when you get off. Like, go <laughs> <Right>. outside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So talk to me about squash. Oh, um, I used to play squash. <laughs> it's kind of like rapping. Is it really, though? When I read that, I was like, that doesn't seem... I guess it's like girls playing soccer, but squash is not really like so mainstream, I guess. Does well, that make sense? Well, it's super... It's, yes, it's very East Coast. It's a very mm-hmm. East Coast sport. I wouldn't call it mainstream on the East Coast, because unfortunately... It's much associated with Ivy League schools and upper middle class prep schools and stuff like that, which is unfortunate because not all of us are from that environment. Right, yeah. Um, (laughs) But many people are. So I started playing squash randomly when I was eight or nine years old. I grew up in Brooklyn and someone faked our, my family got us into this kind of phony country club in Brooklyn, which is very odd. And it turned out to be the best junior squash program in the country then and now. And I was really good immediately. It was a really strange coincidence. This is not anything my parents would have done. They're like Mm. academic, liberal, radical, political radicals. And then suddenly we're in this country club, the Heights Casino. Aids were all white and it was pretty buttoned down. (laughs) Yeah. I was like the odd kid. There was was a few odd kids. Um, (laughs) But I was better than everyone else in my age category. Almost immediately. Although I had a lot of a bumpy road because it's a community where if you're just a little bit different, they would rake you over the coals. Though a lot of the people I grew up playing with have turned into or were pretty interesting now. So I stuck with it and mm-hmm. I was really good in college. And then 
I figured if you spend your entire childhood in college doing this one thing, maybe it's worth pursuing afterwards. So I played mm. professional squash for a number of years, though never... It's always misleading to to say that on my resume because mm -hmm. I always did other things. Like I edited a magazine, right. I wrote books. I, yeah. I was never like, well, there was like three years where all I did was play squash. But for mm -hmm. the eight years that I played squash, I was doing other things. Right, right. But it was a fun way to see the world. I lived in, was able to support myself and right. barely. I mean, yeah, so, I see you were in London and Amsterdam. Yeah, barely, and... barely, barely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the, yeah. it's it, like being an artist. Exactly. Really. Exactly. I mean, so where did the writing, what inspired you to start writing well let's see I always wanted to do something creative I never wanted to work in an office I couldn't really figure out what kind of job I wanted to do like mm -hmm. I think about it a lot like what would I do I was like maybe I'd love to run my own magazine that's just not an entry-level job you know <laughs> but while I was playing squash my dad was very very supportive of my squash career and but also aware that maybe I should be doing something else, especially mm. having gone to college for four years. And my mom was like, how can you be an athlete all the time? You know, don't you? So they were putting a little pressure on me to stop playing at one point or not mm. stop playing, but start thinking about other stuff. And my dad was like, kept sending me film school applications. And my mom mm. was like, when are you moving home? And I was like, <laughs> a better idea. I'm going to write a novel. So you get off my back. Both my parents work in publishing and magazines and books and they're like oh no like we meant like get a real job not play squash which is really difficult and write books which is really also quite difficult right. you know I wanted to do something creative I'm not artistic <laughs> I'm a really bad artist I'm not good at that I have to make valentines for my daughter's school next week I'm like oh my god <laughs> I'm left-handed, so scissors. I'm not good with scissors. Well, that's not a bad thing. My mom's left-handed. My yeah. brother was ambidextrous, and he eventually went right. But he was a uh, he could pitch both hands. That's really rare. Like yeah. truly ambidextrous people mm -hmm. like that are really rare. Yeah, that's cool. So, yeah. So, what are your thoughts about the desert now? And is it a place that you? think about when you're in LA about sure. visiting again or absolutely my friend and I were over at 29 Palms Inn having lunch and she's never been out here and she's oh. like can we take the kids I was like yeah let's go to the office and make a reservation <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome and that's a great place it reminds me because I'm from Jersey it reminds me of um like either up in the Catskills some of the resorts up Absolutely. there, right? Yeah, the or, Adirondacks. Um, Mount Airy Lodge. Oh my God, I've been to Mount Airy Lodge. Me too. It was a senior class trip. <laughs> yeah, I went there. It was really down at heel. It was, yeah. but like, this was like when I was 21. So. It was probably 18, after 19 I. 19 years, 19 years ago, so I was 21. Yeah, I was there in the 80s. Yeah, so this was, <laughs> things were closed and like yeah, burning, kind of. like something had burned. But yes, it's like a little Adirondack cab, like mm -hmm. lakeside retreat. In, yeah. It does feel sort of East Coast. Yeah, when yeah. I the first very first time I went there, I was like, "Wow, this is like uh, Dirty Dancing," you know? Yeah, there, yeah, exactly. it's like that. It reminded me of that. Though my friend Grant said, felt, said it felt like the U.S. consulate in Guam, and I'm like, I also get that too. Oh, well, like, I've never been to neither that. Neither have I, but like, oh. he's from South Africa, but he's oh. like, this pool. I feel like I'm at the U.S. consulate in the Pacific Island. <laughs> it's like not nice outside of this consulate. Mm. <laughs> so, what are some of your favorite things to do when you are out here? I love to drive around. I mean, mm -hmm. I know it's a weird thing to want to do. Because you should be outside, but you can cover so much land. I love to go all the way down through Wonder Valley mm -hmm. on both sides on the 62 or on the Amboy Road. It's almost like a dare to see how far you can go. There's right. nothing there. No, you know? I know. And, yeah. and like, you're like, is, there, your really, gas full? is there really nothing here? <laughs> um, I love to drive through the park whenever someone comes to visit us, or me and my husband, or we go to, in a couple extra days, we go to the park because I feel like. The loop, if you enter here in Joshua mm -hmm. Tree and Jurassic right. 29 Palms, yeah. it's the biggest bang for your buck mm -hmm. of nature that you can get in the United States. Right. It's that loop. You see a good chunk of the park, and you see several different landscapes, and you're just driving through it. Yes, it's better to hike it. Camp, but, like, but if you don't have older time, and they can, you don't right. have time. Exactly. And it's just like... It's amazing. I forget. Like, I've done it so many times. Right. And when I bring people, they're like, oh, my God, are we on Mars? <laughs> so I just love that experience with other people yeah. of doing that. I just mm -hmm. think it's wild. And they're and the park, I'm just blown away by how curated each hike is. Like, they're these small, this one's an hour, and it's really great. All the mm -hmm. signs are there. It's subtly landscaped. It's really great. I love it. There's a hike that I love to do 
off of Indian Cove campground. And I can't remember what it's called, but it's, you're like in the, you feel like you're walking through a terrarium, which is oh, great. Wow. Yeah. That's nice. There's a nice area too. You can enter off of La Contenta road. It's called Covington Flats. Oh, I haven't done that. That's a whole different, there's an, and there's not really, a, well, now that I'm saying it, <laughs> but there's really usually not a lot of people out there. Oh, I like that. So it's really like secluded and stuff like that. We went to the super, everyone wanted to go to the super bloom and like, the mm. big places. I'm like, I'm going to go to the park and just see a few flowers. It's, it was pretty amazing yeah, this year. Yeah. Really was. I, a lot of people like to go to Anza Borrego. Anza Borrego. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting. But I was like, I want to just see a place that I'm more familiar with and see how it transforms. Mm-hmm. I love all those things. Um, what else do I like? Just, there's so many weird little things you discover. I'd never been, to, until a year ago, I'd never been to the Noah Purifoy Museum. Mm. No, I, I went today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been so many times since yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's a lot to it. really explore. Yeah. Yeah. There really is. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming and talking today. And look for Ivy's book, Wonder Valley, Amazon, everywhere. Just find it. We'll put some links in the show notes and on the blog. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a real treat. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much for listening to the Desert Lady Diaries podcast. I want you to know how much I appreciate you taking the time to tune in. If you heard something that inspired or enlightened you, I'd love to hear about it. Send an email to DesertLadyDiaries at gmail.com or start a discussion with other listeners at the Desert Lady Diaries Facebook page. Next week, Desert resident Constance Walsh talks to us about living on Main Street and working to save Pioneer Town from resort developers in the 1970s who wanted to raise it and make it a resort. Thanks so much for listening.